recalculated the entire history of the Formula 1 Drivers' Championship with a twist. What if you could only be the champion once? Starting from the very start of the championship, I took all of Formula 1's real-life results, removed any previous champions, promoted everyone up, and then found the new champion for each season, before moving on to the next one. Last episode, we began where the Formula 1 Championship began in 1950. We saw some familiar faces win it along the way. Farina, Fangio, Ascari, Stuart, Fittipaldi, Lauda, Prost and Senna, but we also saw some new names added to the list. A few fan favourites made the list, Sterling Moss, Bruce McLaren, Gilles Villeneuve, but we also added some champions that you may be slightly less familiar with. Jose Froelan Gonzalez, Jean-Pierre Beltoise. We ended last episode at the end of the 1980s. Nelson Piquet's continued struggle for the title was replaced by Nigel Mansell's frustrations at the very top of F1. In the last two seasons, he's won every race he's finished, but that was only eight out of 29 starts. In the last four seasons, he's come second in the championship, three times. Can he turn things around in the 1990s? And which other new names will be added to our list of champions? Let's hop back in the time machine and find out. Welcome to the 90s, baby. Formula One is bigger than ever. With a huge decade behind it, Formula One is now a household name, one of the most watched things every Sunday. And how do we start the decade? Exactly how we ended the last one, with Nigel Mansell in a title fight. This time against Thierry Boutsen in his very own Williams Red 5. It's white when Boutsen has it, that was just a Mansell thing. Going into the last race of the season, these two are equal on points. Tension is all around the sport. Mansell famously has trash luck in Australia, so this is going to be interesting. Mansell lines up P1, Boutsen can only achieve P4. This year, however, unlike previous years, is uneventful for Nigel out front. No tyre blowouts, no spins, he just goes from P1 and wins the race and finally the Formula 1 driver's title. Having spent so long at the top of the sport through the 1980s, Mansell retires with 29 career wins, by far the most in the sport up until this point. The 1991 season is not so close. The top six finishers from the real life championship, as well as every race winner, are not here, which leaves the door open for Jean and Lacey to take a dominant championship with seven wins. The end of this season is marked by the arrival of exciting young rookie Michael Schumacher, who wins the Italian Grand Prix, his second ever race. I wonder if he will do well in 1992. Yes, yes, he does very well in 92. Schumacher displays an unheard of level of consistency to win nine of the 16 races with 12 total podiums. When he finishes a race this season, his lowest finish is third. This marks the first time a driver has ever scored more than 100 points in a season. His Benetton teammate, Martin Brundle, wins almost every other race this season to come second in the championship with 90 points, a points tally which in any season previously would have seen him win the title. The only other driver to win a race this season? Oh, just some Finnish guy called Mika Hakkinen. 1993 and the legacy of Schumacher's monstrous season the year before leaves people wondering, could this ever be repeated? Second year driver Damon Hill says, yes, yes it can. 10 wins over the season brings him to the exact same points tally as Schumacher the year before, 106. Martin Brundle again places second, but this time it is not close, less than half of Hill's points, an absolutely monstrous season. 1994 is a much more varied affair. After two wins for Rubens Barrichello, we then get eight different race winners in the next eight races. At the end of the season, things settle down a bit, and Mika Hakkinen goes on a strong run of form to finish with four total wins and the Drivers' Championship under his belt. 1995 would bring the Battle of the Brits, England versus Scotland, as David Coulthard and Johnny Herbert battle it out for the title. Heading into the final round in Australia, Herbert leads by four points. If Coulthard can draw level, he will win the championship on head-to-head -head because he has more wins. Coulthard qualifies on pole and leads the race comfortably through his first stint. However, at his first stop, eager to hold on to the lead, he comes into the pits too quickly and collides with the pit wall. In one heartbreaking instant which catches fans completely off guard, the championship is handed directly to Johnny Herbert, one of the most notorious and famous title deciders in the history of the sport. 1996 saw a new kid on the block, Jacques Villeneuve, son of Gilles Villeneuve, our 1979 champion, and to say he had a good rookie season would be 
an understatement. He took 11 wins from 16 races on his way to the highest points tally ever, 114 points. This includes a new record for the longest ever win streak, seven wins in a row. The best F1 season ever by a rookie makes this one of the most famous seasons in the sport, and further increases the popularity of Formula One through the 1990s. Before the 1997 season, our very own Martin Brundle retires. In this timeline, he's run up to the champion twice and finishes with 13 career wins, at the time, the most ever by a driver who didn't win the championship. 1997 sees a title battle between David Coulthard and Heinz Harald Frentzen. Sadly for the Scotsman though, a DNF at the Nürburgring and only P5 at Suzuka sees his title chances fizzle out, handing Frentzen the 1997 title. Coulthard was back at the top again in 98, and this time he was able to hold off Ferrari's Eddie Irvine and claim the title after five years at the very top of the sport. With several strong contenders now banned, 1999 is a bit of a blowout season to end the decade. Eddie Irvine wins 10 on his way to 121 points, a new record, and the last title of this millennium. Despite a bit of a lull in the final season, the 1990s see incredible growth of Formula 1, with exciting young talent putting up record numbers and some storied title battles. We end the season with Formula 1 more popular than it's ever been. Can the noughties carry on the success? It's a new millennium, and new technology is ready to propel Formula 1 even higher. Just look at these insane TV resolutions. On track, the technical marvel of Ferrari's F1 2000 is jaw-dropping. There seems to be only two options for Rubens Barrichello this season, P1 or DNF. He chooses P1 13 times. Second place in the championship, Ralf Schumacher, is 70 points behind at the end of the season. 70. 2001 sees a host of new rookies joining the sport, including Juan Pablo Montoya, Kimi Raikkonen, and Fernando Alonso. Montoya and Raikkonen were placed P2 and P4 in the championship, but no one really could come close to Ralf Schumacher. Six wins on his way to a championship makes our first ever pair of champion brothers in the sport. Ralf's retirement from the sport then paves the way for his Williams teammate, Juan Pablo Montoya, to take the title in 2002, only his second season in the sport. After four years in a row with no title battles, fears start to creep into the F1 fan base that the sport may now just be dominated by whoever has the best car, particularly as reliability is now better than ever. Discussions also pop up about the low numbers of cars on the grid. 2002 only had 15 full-time drivers. 2003 and Williams dominance turns into McLaren dominance. Third year driver Kimi Raikkonen wins 10 on the way to 124 points and the title. He's 35 points clear of P2, Fernando Alonso. 2004 sees a shock change in form as new regulations help BAR jump up to the front of the grid. Fan favourite driver Jensen Button capitalises on his team's new form and wins 10 on the way to the title. In a weird case of deja vu, he is exactly 35 points ahead of P2, Fernando Alonso. For 2005, Renault absolutely nailed the new tyre and aero regulations, allowing Alonso to jump up from perennial runner-up to clear championship favourite. Alonso would win 13 races to take the title with a record-breaking 155 points. In other news this season, the US Grand Prix is infamous for starting with only four cars on the grid over protests about tyre safety. Alonso's retirement leaves the door open for his Renault teammate Fisichella in 2006, but the title does not come as easily as it did for the Spaniard. Ferrari signed Felipe Massa, and at the same time, their pace seems to catch up with that of Renault. An intense title battle ensues between the two, with the leader of the championship changing multiple times throughout the season. The decider would come down to Brazil in front of Massa's home crowd. Massa needs to outscore Fisichella by five points this race to secure the championship. He wins the race from pole, but is powerless to stop Fisichella coming home in P2 behind him. Massa takes the top step of the podium in front of his home fans, losing the championship. In 2007, Massa is once again involved in a fierce title battle, this time with McLaren rookie Lewis Hamilton. This time, Hamilton clinches the title in Japan, and so while he doesn't lose the championship there, Massa once again takes the top step of the podium in Brazil, runner-up in the championship, 
a gruelling second time in a row. Comparisons obviously arise between Hamilton's rookie season and Villeneuve's in 96. While Hamilton only won 9 races to Villeneuve's 11, Hamilton did win his very first race and stood on the podium in his first 9 races in a row. He would only miss out on points once in his career, when he overshot the entry to the pits in China. Two close title battles in a row, both involving Massa, peak F1 viewership for the 2008 season, and it does not disappoint. Massa is once again involved in a back and forth title battle, this time with Robert Kubica, who burst onto the scene the year previous. Going into the last race in Brazil, Kubica leads the championship with 104 points. Massa, P2, has 99. Things start to look up for Massa though when he qualifies on pole and Kubica can only manage P10 on the grid. Things then go from bad to worse for the Polish driver when a strategy error just before the race with changing weather conditions sees him have to duck into the pits at the end of the formation lap to change to inters. Despite his efforts fighting his way back through the field, Kubica can only recover to 8th handing the championship to Massa in front of his home crowd. He stood on the top step of this podium two years in a row and seen the championship slip out of his reach. To see Massa finally conquer the Formula 1 title in Brazil makes this one of the most emotional moments in Formula 1 history. A regulation change of 2009 sees a change of guard at the front. It takes him a couple of races to figure things out, but Red Bull then come out swinging, trading wins between their two drivers, Mark Webber and Sebastian Vettel. They go into the final race only two and a half points apart, but despite lining up P1 and P2, Webber cannot keep up with Vettel, who coasts home pole to flag to win the championship aged only 22, matching Hamilton and Bruce McLaren before him. After several years without a championship fight at the start of the decade, the continued storyline of Massa's title hopes, along with some exciting new rookies, reignite Formula 1's popularity going into the 2010s. Worrying signs are creeping in though. There's nothing to suggest that the dominant seasons of the early noughties won't return. Many fans are now starting to question whether the rule barring world champions from returning is a good idea at all, particularly as fitness and safety is extending driver careers longer than ever before. Fan favourite champions from previous years, Massa, Hamilton, Button, Alonso, Raikkonen, even champions from the 90s like Michael Schumacher are enjoying long, illustrious careers in other racing series around the world. It becomes a popular topic of discussion among fans of Formula 1 what the championship could possibly look like if these names were allowed to stay in the sport. 2010 brings a new point system and immediately Mark Webber puts it to new use by scoring an eye-watering 372 points. Mercedes' Nico Rosberg tries to hold on in P2 with 4 wins of his own, but it is no match for Webber's 12, making him the 2010 champion. 2011 is more of the same, this time with Nico Rosberg pulling out an impressive points tally ahead of Adrian Suttil in P2 and rookie Paul de Resta in P3. 2012 seems to operate on a one Nico out, one Nico in basis as Nico Hulkenberg returns for his second season after a year out. He immediately gets tangled up in the ultra rare five way title battle, also including Paul de Resta, Kamui Kobayashi, Sergio Perez, and Roman Grosjean, now driving his first full season. Ugh. Look at this graph! This is what we like to see! At one point after the German Grand Prix, these five drivers were separated by only 14 points. Dresta and Hülkenberg would emerge as the late season favourites, and a surge in the last few races of the season sees Nico Hülkenberg win it all. By the standards of previous champions, he doesn't get all that many podiums, it's almost like he has something weird about those, but he does get enough to snag himself a championship. 2013 welcomes a number of new drivers including Esteban Gutierrez, Valtteri Bottas and Jules Bianchi, but even with the newcomers, the grid shrinks to just 13 full-time cars. Roman Grosjean and Sergio Perez battle out for the 2013 title, before a five-win streak for Grosjean crowns him champion in the United States. He wins 16 races in just two and a half seasons in the sport, an impressive tally by any metric. He is widely regarded as one of the best drivers of the decade, if a little crash prone. For 2014, in an effort to curb declining viewerships, Formula 1 introduces the double points finale in Abu Dhabi and it works. The title fight is still close going into the final round, with Williams' Valtteri Bottas on 337 and Red Bull's Daniel Ricciardo on 324. Bottas qualifies P1 with Ricciardo P2, 
but Ricardo is then relegated to a pit lane start due to an illegal front wing. During the race, Ricardo fights his way back through almost the entire field with easily the best race pace out there. However, there's not enough laps for him to catch Bottas. He finishes P2, nine seconds behind, winning Bottas the title. The new engine regulations for this year significantly reduced vehicle reliability, and as a result, nine races saw less than 10 classified finishers. The 2015 season wouldn't see 10 finishers in a race until round 13 in Singapore. This would be the only race of the season, with 10 cars finishing. The season starts pretty unconventionally with a win for Sauber rookie Felipe Nasa, followed by a win for Toro Rosso rookie Max Verstappen, and then one more win for Nasa. Normal programming is then resumed when the Red Bulls of Daniel Ricciardo and Daniel Kvyat start to pick up wins, with a few sprinkled in for Force India's Sergio Perez. The season would once again go to Abu Dhabi, where Daniel Kvyat brings it home P3 to win the title. For 2016, Daniel Ricciardo once again has to fight off his teammate for the championship when the impressive Max Verstappen is promoted up to Red Bull. Ricciardo has a pretty good tactic for this though. Finish every race except one on the podium. A fourth in Brazil is his lowest finish of the season, making 20 podiums from 21 starts, including 12 wins more than enough to take the title. 2017 sees a close battle between Max Verstappen and Sergio Perez. Perez starts the season strong and boy does he need it because Verstappen goes on to win the last six races of the season. A few P2s and P3s do prove to be enough for Sergio Perez though, who holds on to the title by just four points in Abu Dhabi, the closest margin of this new point system. Max Verstappen has seven DNFs to Perez's one, and the crash Stappen moniker gives him a point to prove going into 2018. Prove it, he does! In 2018, Max Verstappen wins 16 races, including the last nine in a row. 415 points is by far the largest points tally ever, and this season goes down as one of the greatest individual performances by any driver in the sport. Already coming close to the title twice before, in just four seasons Max Verstappen racks up 37 career wins, and also demolishes every other record imaginable. 2019 and we end the decade with a number of new faces. George Russell at Williams, Lando Norris at McLaren, and Alex Albon at Toro Rosso. For now, Giovinazzi gets his first full season drive, 2008 runner-up Robert Kubica returns, and second year driver Charles Leclerc is promoted to Ferrari. Leclerc watched Verstappen score 415 points last year and clearly thought, that's cute. Aided by the reintroduction of the fastest lap point and 17 wins, he scores 458 points, marking two straight years of absolute dominance. Behind him, Red Bull swap Pierre Gasly and Alex Albon to somehow achieve P2 and P3 in the Drivers' Championship with only one car. Good job, I guess? The 2019 season only had 10 cars on the grid, raising serious concerns about the future of the sport. The only thing holding it together seems to be the impressive rookie talent that's just come in, believed by many pundits to be some of the strongest new drivers the sport has ever seen. As we enter the 2020s, a strong push on social media and streaming services brings a host of new fans into the sport to support these new young drivers. Can Formula 1 deliver some interesting title battles to keep them hooked? 2020 would seem to say yes, as we kick the decade off with a three-way title battle between Alex Albon and McLaren teammates Carlos Sainz and Lando Norris. Sainz falls out of contention after a bizarre Sakir Grand Prix where Pietro Fittipaldi is the first driver to finish a race outside the top 10 since Singapore 2016, which leaves the decider in Abu Dhabi where Norris basically just needs Alex Albon to DNF. They line up Norris P1, Albon P2. Sadly for Norris, Albon does not DNF. He overtakes the McLaren and cruises home in P1 to take the flag and the title. The 2021 season is again a tumultuous title battle between friends turned rivals Carlos Sainz and Lando Norris. Going into the final round, Norris leads the championship by just six points. Norris lines up on pole, Sainz P2. Close together for the entire first lap, Sainz takes Norris down into turn 9 and holds the lead from there. Seeming to struggle with his tyres throughout the race, Norris cannot keep up with Sainz and is even passed by the two Alpha Tauris on strong form at the end of the season. P1 will hand Sainz the title, but a final spark of hope emerges for Norris when a late safety car is brought out for a Latifi crash. 
Despite pressures from the governing bodies to manufacture some kind of last lap battle, race director Michael Massey follows all procedures correctly. The lap cars, along with the two Alpha Tauris between Sainz and Norris, prove too difficult to pass on the last lap of racing, and Sainz cruises home to take his title. Norris does not get an opportunity to fight for the title again in 2022, as George Russell now has Mercedes underneath him and he uses it to completely dominate the season. 18 wins, only one DNF, and the new sprint race format sees Russell reach new heights on 529 points. 2023, our most recent season, and this time Lando Norris has no one to stand in his way. Remaining patient through a slow start technically is McLaren finds the pace to win races in the second half of the season, and he wins 11 of the last 14, pulling a sizable margin over the Drivers' Championship. Alpine's Pierre Gasly and Aston Martin's Lance Stroll put in strong performances for P2 and P3 in the championship with a couple of wins each. But finally, after three runner-up seasons in a row, Lando Norris is crowned the Formula One world champion. And so we get to our current season, 2024. Of our 20 real life competitors, only eight of them remain on the grid in this timeline. Oscar Piastri wins the first three races in a row and looks set to dominate this championship. Will fans get bored of McLaren dominance? Taking a look at some driver records in our alternate reality does raise some interesting questions. Max Verstappen has the most career wins by quite some margin, but in this series where the objective is to win it and move on, is more wins better? Most of these drivers got stuck fighting and not winning championships for multiple seasons. Surely it reflects better on a driver if they can just win it cleanly. That might be harsh, to be honest. Winning a race is still hard, and winning 37 is, well, 37 times as hard? I don't think anyone is saying Max Verstappen is a bad driver in this timeline. Likely, he would be regarded as one of the greatest to ever do it. He also has two of the longest ever win streaks in the sports history, much like real life, and so may well be considered the GOAT in this timeline. One record you definitely don't want is career wins without a title. This is taken up by some familiar faces, with Esteban Ocon leading the way on 15 wins. In real life, the record for most podiums without a win is held by Lando Norris on 14. I am recording this before the Japanese Grand Prix. Lando Norris, please do not make that fact wrong. Somehow, in this timeline though, Eddie Cheever has racked up 18 podiums without ever winning. If that's what's possible... Buckle in, Lando fans. This timeline is obviously flawed by the fact that I cannot simulate all of the replacements for drivers as they leave the sport. In reality, obviously, teams would have found replacements for world championships as they left, and so cars like the McLaren MP44, Ferrari F2002 and F2004, Red Bull RB9 and Mercedes W07 would still have been there fighting for championships, just with different drivers inside them. I like to think though that this list does give quite a nice indication of the top drivers from each generation by removing the mask that dominance can sometimes leave over the sport. The new champions on this list would likely have been the drivers promoted to the top teams when the established greats left, and so I like to think this is a nice way to evaluate talent in a sport where the top has a tendency to stick around for longer and longer periods of time. One other thing I mentioned before is the sad historical fact posthumous champions and fatalities in the sport. This timeline has two new posthumous champions, but actually the only one from our real timeline, Jochen Rint, would not have been driving in the Grand Prix where his fatal accident occurred. In fact, there's multiple other people where this applies. Peter Collins wouldn't have been driving at the 1958 German Grand Prix, Luigi Musso wouldn't have been driving at the 1958 French Grand Prix, Ronnie Peterson wouldn't have been driving at the 1978 Italian Grand Prix, Gilles Villeneuve wouldn't have been driving at the 1982 Belgian Grand Prix, Elio De Angelis probably wouldn't have been testing a Brabham F1 car in 1986, and Ayrton Senna wouldn't have been driving at the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix. I'm obviously not going to provide any speculation on how these drivers' lives would have played out differently if this was the case. Rather, I would just like to raise awareness for the brutal history of this sport, pay some respect to those who lost their lives in the name of their passion, and once again provide a reminder why safety needs to be a constant push in motorsport. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I had the idea for this a while ago, but I really didn't realize how much work it was gonna be when I started calculating all the seasons. This one took 
a few weeks to put together, so a like on this video or even a share to any other Formula 1 nerds you know would be greatly appreciated to help out the channel. I've been Mr V, thank you guys for watching, and as always, I will see you guys later.